To truly understand the astonishingly true history of the unfinished obelisk, one must first wade through a quagmire of well-financed fallacy, infested with many a false prophet, incomplete or simply illogical conjecture, all of which defended by countless academic figures of institutions of influence and power, acquired via the funding in their defense of a form of mass worship of academics' perception, as if an all-knowing authority. So, with things like the obelisk, for example, one begins to wonder if this all be by design. Since academic records of this monument began, no one who has described it, predictably, has ever managed to wrap their head around how such a stone could have possibly ever been moved. Ergo, all well-funded explorers, reporters, and journalists alike, with the expectant pressure of their return with a deciphered mystery. It would appear this explanation never arose, yet was skillfully averted. Firstly, the rock had indeed been abandoned abruptly at some point in history conveniently allowing academia to make nearly all those interested in the obelisk overlook this eventual intention by its original creators, a distraction made by a fault line. Chris Dunn, an independent investigator held in varied regard, found that details of decoration were already being added to the stone as it was being hewn, running exactly through this so-called fault disproving this so-long-held academic fallacy. Yet, alas, although the unfinished obelisk lay still attached to the strata of Earth, like that of the larger of the two megaliths in Yangshan Quarry, the largest some 16,000 tons, academia is not required nor would even attempt to provide any logical explanation as to how these blocks would have been moved. Additionally, however, and perhaps most revealing, is the pregnant lady of Lebanon, a 1,000-plus ton megalith, so large that just like that of the unfinished obelisk, no attempt was ever made to explain the ancient civilization responsible could have moved such stones to their final placements. Yet, remarkably, the proverbial nail in the coffin and vindication of our claim was the excavations made around the pregnant woman, recently revealing that this stone was not abandoned on a slight incline, as claimed, but was placed atop another stone of even bigger proportions, suggesting it was part of a once enormous structure and exposing this reoccurring academic strategy when it comes to dismissing the controversial. It is a reality which we find incredibly annoying. Countless arenas resulting in a continued academic perplexment still litter Egypt's Giza Plateau. The pyramids, the Great Sphinx, the enormous megalithic blocks which made them, not to mention the mountain of ancient yet clearly incredibly precise, seemingly highly advanced tool marks which can still be found across the still surviving fragment of its basalt floor. 1,000-plus ton ancient singing statues, mysterious staircases cut directly into an inexplicably enormous, mysteriously concrete-like plateau, one strong enough to continue to be the foundation for the Great Pyramids themselves. The burning question then remains, who built this magnificent place? And can it be proven that Along with these structures, not being the work of the currently claimed ancient Egyptians, but can be connected to countless other equally baffling ruins, a few even found in some of the most remote landmasses on Earth, proof, if there ever was, of a once highly advanced, ocean-going, world-dominant, yet now lost civilization. Menkari, as mentioned in a previous video, the smallest of the pyramids, has undeniable polygonal casing stones, masonry in the exact same style and stone as that of ancient Peruvian sites. Yet in addition to these granite blocks partly encasing Menkur, Aswan, its quarry with its gargantuan unfinished obelisk, and indeed its temple, are yet another series of undeniable proofs as to the true identity 
of the original builders of ancient Egypt. Although, due to the clear similarity of the polygonal masonry, a now lost yet unique technique of placing seemingly randomly shaped stones without mortar perfectly together, with that of Sacsayhuaman, Machu Picchu, along with many other, the Temple of Aswan, when looked upon closely, possesses polygonal perfection. Created to the same level of accuracy as that of Cusco, however, we feel, due to the medium of creation being softer, that of sandstone, their abilities and accuracy in producing this lost masonry technique, which has now been identified all over the world, really shines through. Are we looking at the proof needed to not only connect the most incredible, unexplainably ancient megalithic sites worldwide? Where the pyramids, ancient Peru, Easter Island, Ethiopia, the list goes on, all built by the same lost civilization? We find the evidence to support such claim highly compelling. The severe undulating erosion upon the walls of the Sphinx enclosure undoubtedly showed that the Sphinx had been heavily weathered long before the Sahara became a desert. Therefore, one must suspect that it could indeed be over 9,000 years old. Not knowing exactly how much rainfall there's been in the distant past, the Sphinx could indeed be far older than this. The most notable scholarly advocates, Robert Scotch, argues that the Sphinx may be far older than 12,000 years. Robert Baval and Graham Hancock proposed that the Sphinx may have been built around 10,500 BC, during the last age of Leo. Anthony West believes everything on the Giza Plateau testifies to an advanced, secure and long-settled civilization. Therefore, he suggests that the Sphinx may have been built not during the age of Leo, but a whole processional cycle earlier, in around 36,000 BC a date he feels is more in keeping with the history of Egypt as chronicled by certain Egypt kings. Regardless of an exact date, all of these talented Egyptologists propose a date set much further back within history than currently accepted, and they have provided considerable evidence to back up such conclusions. At the time of disclosure, the argument sent shockwaves through the Egyptologist establishment, not because of the datings, Egyptologists and mainstream historians have grown quite inept at ignoring data, but more because it was realized that there is, indeed, no other explanation for their arguments. There is little doubt that the Sphinx enclosure was subject to severe erosion within its lifetime, and although it could have been explained away as a naturally formed enclosure, we fortunately know from analysis that the limestone blocks dug out from there were then used within the building of nearby Sphinx Temple. Interestingly, no other site in Egypt shows the same type or degree of erosion. Was the evidence hidden away, concealed from the public in what could only be called a conspiracy? Sediments surrounding the base of the monuments and a once existing watermark upon the stones halfway up the Great Pyramid's sides indicate just that. Two-inch thick salt incrustations once found within inner chambers Silt sediments rising to 14 feet around the bases of the pyramids found to contain seashells and fossils that have been radiocarbon dated at nearly 12,000 years old have indeed slowly vanished over the years. These sediments could only have been deposited in such great quantities by major sea flooding. A watermark was also once clearly visible on the limestone casing stones of the Great Pyramid. These stones were unfortunately unknowingly removed by invading Arabs. These watermarks were halfway up the sides of the pyramid, or about 400 feet above the present level of the Nile River, 200 feet above the base. It seems the last remaining shred of evidence, the enclosure, survived due to the talented individuals that were required to spot it. Individuals who are thankfully on our side. Egypt Undoubtedly, one of the most controversial places for modern history to try to keep the control of, in regards to its origin, its true age, or original builder. When one either visits the Giza Plateau, and is lucky enough to gaze upon these three great pyramids, or merely able to peer upon them through their computer screens, the first thing that will usually cross one's mind is awe and amazement. 
Yet this is often instinctually followed by an air of wonder. A curiosity as to how these miraculous structures were built, who could have possibly built them, and most importantly of all, why. Yet these questions, and indeed the pursuit of their answers, has been a mission for many well-funded deceptive individuals, for many years, to work very hard to distract you from either asking or pursuing as personal line of inquiry. For example, the Golden Mask of King Tut, along with the many other undoubtedly spectacularly valuable artifacts, encrusted with precious metals and jewels that can be seen littering Egypt in its many museums and in the mountains of literature, books, and touring exhibits, which are published, pushed, and permitted in regards to this spectacular area of human history. Grand Egyptian Museum late last month was an exciting event for archaeologists worldwide and a source of pride for Egyptians. We moved today the sixth and the last chariot of King Tutankhamun from the, from the military museum in the citadel, which was there since 1987, to the gem. So we were keen to show you the moving of this uh, very nice artifact and the packing and unpacking uh, method, uh, professional method you are using by my colleagues in the ministry. The Tutankhamun exhibit, comprising about 5,000 pieces, will display for the first time all of Tutankhamun's artifacts in one place. Experts from around the world have been consulted on how best to preserve and display the collection. When museum workers accidentally knocked off the beard of King Tut's burial mask in 2015 and hastily glued it back on, there were fears that modern chemicals would cause permanent damage to the artifact. But scholars around the world put their heads together to save the golden mask. The museum will also be a venue for international conferences on Egyptology. And there is something in you always. We found out today in my talk, the family of Tutankhamun through DNA. How Tutankhamun died. No one murdered him. My excavation in the Valley of the Monks that we are doing right now, important excavation looking for the tomb of Archis in Amun. Maybe soon a tomb will be revealed in the Valley of the Monks or the West Valley of the kings. Most of the artifacts in the Tutankhamun exhibit have been relocated from the Egyptian Museum in Cairo. Their new home is only about two kilometers away from the place where the young pharaoh's tomb was discovered in 1922. Egyptian officials say the gem will be the world's largest archaeological museum when completed and will hold about 100,000 artifacts in total. We have now 3,000 employees and workmen working inside the project. We are respecting our schedule, will be ready from the engineering uh, part by December 2018, and we are deciding now the perfect time or the ideal timing for the partial opening. In addition to King Tut's exhibit, the museum will display objects related to some of the greatest historic Egyptian kings, such as Ramses II, Akhenaten, and Amenhotep III. The ancient Egyptians, although claimed as ingenious, were merely adaptive. Just like the equally acclaimed Romans and Incas of Peru, these re-inhabitants merely rediscovered the creations of a far older, far more advanced predecessor, who I believe not only constructed these sanctuaries, which these well-studied ancient civilizations merely used to enable the flourishment of their own cultures, in turn, leaving a smorgasbord of architectural artifacts for funded academics to excavate and subsequently parade around, usually bombarding many individuals with deep insights into their lifestyles, culture, and death practices, are yet, as I would have predicted, nearly always absent, that which supports my posit. Any logical explanation or demonstration of how these people built these structures in which they once inhabited like a void in their academic study, one which is not only consistently ignored and concealed by these same academics, but are unknown facts to all of modern humanity to this day. This mystery is a result of the incredible nature of these structures, the precision involved in their constructions, and the enormity of some of the stones used in the building of the structures. Many of you may have seen my recent videos or be a keen follower of my work, and as such, 
are aware of the fact that due to my in-depth study of the unknowns regarding these sites worldwide, and the collection and collaboration of the similarities and differentiabilities I have personally collected and categorized regarding many of these ancient structures, I have personally been able to establish a very strong, evidence-based hypothesis regarding the identity of three separate lost civilizations, which I have established using signatures within their style of building, and by default differentiations in their styles of building, to unquestionably identify them as separate yet particular groups responsible for the different unexplainable structures spanning the entire globe. Yet although these groups have indeed crossed paths, such areas as Aswan Quarry and most significant to my own research in Italy, where the polygonal civilization built upon the Cyclopean's work, allowing me to establish which preceded which, and although these groups have been established to have abandoned projects midway through, thus indicating that they came to a sudden and untimely demise due to cataclysm, the civilization responsible for the pyramids, and indeed the movement of the blocks at Baalbek in China, which all far exceed 1,000 tons, is yet another civilization which far predated all which I have already identified. These three civilizations are the Polygonal Civilization, the Cyclopean Civilization, and the Neolithic Civilization. Each with their own unique building techniques and identifiable stone-cutting signatures in their technologies. The pyramid builders were unimaginably more capable than all three, and although the Neoliths, who indeed have created some astonishingly advanced ruins, could have quite possibly been a surviving remnant of this civilization, this digression is for another time. Though at sites such as Baalbek, the trilithon, which contains stones over 1,000 tons, there are cyclopean stones built atop the stones, and at other places in the world, polygonal masonry has been found, such as Aksum in Ethiopia, where the toppled obelisk is said by some to be in excess of 1,000 tons, I have never, and now strongly feel will never, find any indicative evidence of these civilizations building the footings under any of these gigantic megaliths, as they were not responsible for their creation or placement. Additionally, the civilization responsible for the pyramids, and these enormous megalithic blocks elsewhere, were also the civilization who created the false door. A mysterious rock-carved feature also found littering the now-exposed mega-metropolis found beneath the Guatemalan rainforest by penetrative radar. Taikal, part of this metropolis, the place where the plaque illustrating a past global cataclysm was once found, also has pyramids built solely leading to these false doors, with one found in Peru, built into the only rock face containing a very peculiar crystal known for its resonance qualities in amplifying radio waves. I feel that much of the spectacles found in modern Egyptian museums are merely distractions from the really important truths which we should all be focusing on instead. Such as the true age of the pyramids, structures which, in the past, I have also independently identified as still possessing three separate identifiable stages of attempted casing stones for conservation, each significantly older or younger than each other with the true exoskeleton of the structures made of stones far in excess of 1,000 tons. Join us next time, where I will expose the controlled opposition within the fringe fields of archaeology, which have stemmed from a growing pursuit for the truth of these facts, with a focus upon the water erosion hypothesis of the Great Sphinx, why it is a misdirection, and the Sphinx's true, original, undeniable identity. Facts and Truths Exposed, which are undoubtedly highly compelling. To truly understand the astonishingly true history of the unfinished obelisk, one must first wade through a quagmire of well-financed fallacy, infested with many a false prophet, incomplete or simply illogical conjecture, all of which defended by countless academic figures of institutions of influence and power, acquired via the funding in their defense of a form of mass worship of academics' perception as if an all-knowing authority. 
So, with things like the obelisk, for example, one begins to wonder if this all be by design. Since academic records of this monument began, no one who has described it, predictably, has ever managed to wrap their head around how such a stone could have possibly ever been moved. Ergo, all well-funded explorers, reporters, and journalists alike, with the expectant pressure of their return with a deciphered mystery. It would appear this explanation never arose, yet was skillfully averted. Firstly, the rock had indeed been abandoned abruptly at some point in history, conveniently allowing academia to make nearly all those interested in the obelisk overlook this eventual intention by its original creators, a distraction made by a fault line. Chris Dunn, an independent investigator held in varied regard, found that details of decoration were already being added to the stone as it was being hewn running exactly through this so-called fault, disproving this so-long-held academic fallacy. Yet, alas, although the unfinished obelisk lay still attached to the strata of Earth, like that of the larger of the two megaliths in Yangshan Quarry, the largest some 16,000 tons, academia is not required nor would even attempt to provide any logical explanation as to how these blocks would have been moved. Additionally, however, and perhaps most revealing, is the pregnant lady of Lebanon, a 1,000-plus ton megalith, so large that just like that of the unfinished obelisk, no attempt was ever made to explain the ancient civilization responsible could have moved such stones to their final placements. Yet, remarkably, the proverbial nail in the coffin and vindication of our claim was the excavations made around the pregnant woman, recently revealing that this stone was not abandoned on a slight incline, as claimed, but was placed atop another stone of even bigger proportions, suggesting it was part of a once enormous structure and exposing this reoccurring academic strategy when it comes to dismissing the controversial. It is a reality which we find incredibly annoying. Along with the many other currently unexplained feats of engineering present within the ancient ruins of Baalbek's temples, is undoubtedly the variety of ancient stones that were somehow incorporated into the structures. Although modern academia, and indeed its supporters, who are all seemingly suffering with selective research syndrome, claim that Baalbek is a Roman ruin, we feel, as mentioned, the sheer size of the ancient megaliths that were installed masterfully into its construction are obviously far too large for our Roman ancestors to have transported from distant quarries and who have installed into the structure. We are more than open to this proposition that they were indeed installed and built by Romans, if we can be provided with one single logical explanation as to how this was done. But as of yet, this remains elusive, absent any academic explanation as to the site. As mentioned, the astonishing array of ancient stones is also an area that is rarely covered by individuals attempting to convey an air of all-knowing to the masses, as these features are, just like the enormous megaliths present at the site, currently unexplainable. Specifically, it's the pink granite columns. The reason for our focus on these particular stones is the fact that this pink granite is only available at one known ancient quarry, that being the famous quarry of Aswan located within modern-day Egypt, an astonishing 1,500 kilometers away. Some of these stones, weighing in at more than 10 metric tons, this achievement, we feel, is clear indication of the fact that the builders of these ancient sites were far more capable than that of our more recent Roman ancestors. For example, as previously covered on our channel, Henri Layard brought two Lamassu weighing in at a similar size around 10 tons to London. This task took over 18 months of arduous suffering for hundreds of our modern ancestors, placed a mere century ago to complete. 
It included several near disasters and included loading them onto wheeled carts, complex systems of modern pulleys and levers operated by dozens of men, the utilization of over 300 men in total, a barge, and a custom-built ramp to haul them up the steps and into the museum. How these same curators, historians, and academics alike can continue to claim that our Roman ancestors completed such tasks, along with the placement of such enormous stone megaliths, is to us absurd. Was the unfinished obelisk found within Aswan the work of the same civilization? We feel that these pink granite columns could, in all possibility, be a link that connects these two ancient sites, and in particular, the Great Pyramids. Was Baalbek, with its enormous granite megaliths, built by the same people as the Great Pyramids? Is the giant megalithic exoskeleton of the Great Pyramids, which we have already exposed, built with the same techniques as Baalbek? We find the evidence to suggest such highly compelling.